First of all, let's just talk about what hypertrophy is and what strength changes in the muscle are. We can make this very simple as well. If this were a muscle physiology class, we would talk all about uh, you know myofibrils and sarcomeres and all that stuff. We're not going to do that. That's not the purpose of today's conversation. So if we want to think about muscle hypertrophy, we have to ask what is changing when muscles get larger or stronger? And there are really just three ways that muscles can be stimulated to change. So let's review those three ways and talk about what happens inside the muscle. So there are three major stimuli for changing the way that muscle works and making muscles stronger, larger, or better in some way. And those are stress, tension, and damage. Those three things don't necessarily all have to be present, but stress of some kind has to exist. Something has to be different in the way that the nerve communicates with the muscle and the way that the muscle contracts or performs that makes the muscle need to change. So this is very reminiscent of neuroplasticity in the brain. Something needs to happen. Certain chemicals need to be present. Certain processes need to happen or else a tissue simply won't change itself. But if those processes and events do happen, then the tissue has essentially no option except but to change. That everyone of pretty much every age should be doing some sort of resistance exercise, even if that's body weight exercises in order to offset this age-related decline in muscle contractile ability, muscle strength, et cetera, improve bone density. There's nothing good about getting frail and weak over time. And people who invest the effort into doing resistance exercise of, of some kind, whether or not it's with bands or with weights or with body weight, really benefit tremendously at a whole body level, at a systemic level, as well as in terms of muscle strength. Because everything about muscle hypertrophy, about stimulating muscle growth, is about generating isolated contractions, about challenging specific muscles in a very unnatural way. Whereas with strength, it's about using musculature as a system, moving weights, moving resistance, moving the body. The specific goal of hypertrophy is to isolate specific nerve to muscle pathways so that you stimulate the chemical and signaling transduction events in muscles so that those muscles respond by getting larger. So there's a critical distinction in terms of getting stronger versus trying to get muscles to be larger, hypertrophy per se, and it has to do with how much you isolate those muscles. Muscle isolation is not a natural phenomenon. It's not something that we normally do. When we walk, we don't think, okay, right calf contract, left calf contract. No, you just generate those rhythmic movements. And of course, there's no reason for them to get stronger or larger in response to those movements. Let's say you were to do a, a kind of strange experiment of attaching 30 pound weights to your ankles and you were to do those movements. Well, if you weren't specifically co contracting your calves in each step, there's no reason for the calves to take on the bulk of the work and you would distribute that work across your hip flexors and other aspects of your musculature. Your whole nervous system seeks to gain efficiency. It seeks to spread out the effort. So you can nest this as a principle for yourself, which is if you want to get stronger, it's really about moving progressively greater loads or increasing the amount of weight that you move. Whereas if you're specifically interested in generating hypertrophy, it's all about trying to generate those really hard, almost painful, localized contractions of muscle. If ever there was an area of practical science that was very confused, very controversial, and almost combative at times, it would be this issue of how best to train. I suppose the only thing that's um, even more barbed wire of a conversation than that is how best to eat for health. Those seem to be the, the uh, two most common areas of, of online battle. And the scientific literature has a lot to say about both of those things. So I'm going to talk about those and I'm going to talk about the research. There's a lot of information saying that you need to move weights that are, you know, 80 to 90% of your one rep maximum or 70% or cycle that for three weeks on and then go to more moderate weights. There, there are a lot of paths. As, um, as some people say, there are a lot of ways to, to add up numbers to get 100. You know, there's a near infinite number of ways to add up different numbers to get to 100. And what's very clear now from all the literature that's transpired, and especially from the literature in this last three years, is that... Once you know roughly your one repetition maximum, the, the maximum amount of weight that you can 
perform an exercise with for one repetition in good form, full, full range of motion, that it's very clear that moving weights or using bands or using body weight, for instance, in the 30 to 80% of one rep maximum, that is going to be the most beneficial range in terms of muscle hypertrophy and strength. So muscle growth and strength. And there will be a bias. If you're moving weights that are in the 75%, 80% range, or maybe even going above that 85 and 90%, you're going to bias your improvements towards strength gain. And if you use weights that are in the 30% of your one repetition maximum or 40% or 50% and doing many more repetitions, of course, then you are biasing towards hypertrophy and what some people like to call muscle endurance, but that's a little bit of a complicated term because endurance we almost always think of as relating to running or swimming or some long bouts of activity. Now, it is clear, however, that one needs to perform those sets to failure where you can't perform another repetition in good form again or near to failure. If you're not already following us on Instagram at Huberman Lab, please do so. There I teach neuroscience tools and information. Oftentimes it's tools and information that I don't cover on the podcast. We're also on Twitter, also at Huberman Lab.